Hey, what's up, 1440? It's Pastor Holden here, and I am here with Faith Facts. What is Faith Facts? They're fun stuff about the Bible. Listen, sometimes it'll be super spiritual. Sometimes it'll just be something fun. And today, I'm gonna kick it off with something kind of fun. Listen, the Bible's real, okay? The Bible is real. And did you know that in the first book of the Bible, it prophesies and literally spells out Jesus' mission and Jesus' coming in the names? Did you know that? I find that absolutely amazing. And the reality of it is, is you realize that names mean something. Like, my name is Holden. Believe it or not, that means to hold on to something. I know, shocker, right? My middle name's Aaron. That actually means to be a teacher. Imagine that. I'm sitting here teaching faith facts. Um, so names mean something. And in Hebrew, names really meant something. Abraham was the father of many nations. Well, the first 10 names of the Bible spells out the gospel. Listen to what I'm about to say. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Kenan means sorrow. Mahalalel means the blessed God. I don't know if I said that right. Jared, I think it's so funny. Mahalalel, Jared, means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. You can fact check this stuff. I have. Lamech means despairing. Noah means comfort or rest. So you have the first 10 names of the first 10 people born in the Bible or the first 10 generations born in the Bible and you have their names and you put it together and you get this. Man is appointed mortal, mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching and his death shall bring the despairing rest. That's amazing. That's the gospel. God came down in the flesh and Jesus died and gave us rest. Isn't that amazing? The Bible's real, and if anybody wants to try to argue with you that it's not, there's you some ammunition. Listen, hey, I hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. I know you're gonna enjoy it. We have a powerful message for you, and until next time, see you then. <laughs>What's up, 1440? Welcome to this month's weekly broadcast. My name is Pastor Catherine. I'm so excited to be with you this morning or today or this evening or whatever time of the day you happen to be watching this broadcast. Um, but it is a brand new month. It's April, which means we are starting a brand new series. And I'm so excited about what the Holy Spirit has to say to us this month um, because we are reflecting on the greatest, most epic story ever told. Um, and that is the story of Jesus. Um, and many of us are familiar, especially this month as Easter approaches or Resurrection Sunday uh, is coming up. Um, the world and the church is more aware this time of year than others of the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, um, which I'm excited because that's what we're gonna be focusing on this month. Uh, but something with that, a lot of times we, because it seems like it's a story that we've heard so much or so often, uh, sometimes we forget uh, and we allow it to uh, lose its potency in our lives. We, it, it loses the weightiness of it. Um, but the Holy Spirit, I believe, instructed us, me, Pastor Holden, Pastor Era, to really take our time with this series. Uh, and so we're going to be going through just the, Jesus's entire journey, all the way from uh, uh, the, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem to the Last Supper, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the cross, uh, and ultimately to the resurrection itself. Um, and it's important that we remember um, all of the details that went into this because this was so prophetic. This was Jesus's journey in purchasing our salvation. And that makes this story not just the greatest story ever told, not just uh, the story that the whole word of God hinges itself on, but that also makes this story personal. It makes this story personal for you. It makes this story personal for me because this is what Jesus did for you. Everything he went through, every detail, every prophecy fulfilled, every single thing we're about to talk about over the next five weeks, I want you to remember that Jesus did for you. And Jesus, is, Jesus purchasing your salvation and mine is not cheap. Nothing was insignificant. Everything had meaning. Everything had weight. Everything had value. And uh, 
I'm really excited to get to kick it off today uh, because we are going to be talking about Palm Sunday. Now, Palm Sunday should be coming up next week, so you've got some time to really meditate on this before you go to church and you celebrate the meaning of Palm Sunday. Um, But we're going to be talking about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And a lot of times this is something that you remember you got the palm branches in children's church and you got to wave them around and take them home. Um, But this is something that has so much significance that up until recently, even as a pastor, a lot of the meaning in this uh, story of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, uh, that there are things in that meaning that I wasn't even aware of until I began to study the word and study deeper. And I began to realize some of these, these truths. So if you have your Bible, open it up with me to Matthew chapter 21. And we are going to read this account and then we're going to just talk through, this is going to be a little bit more of a teaching message rather than a preaching message, but I'm going to teach you and we're going to talk about some of the symbolism in this story, what it represented and why it was important. Um, So Matthew chapter 21, and we're going to start in verse one, very top of the chapter. It says this, And when they came near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples on ahead, saying to them, Go into the village that is opposite of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall reply, The Lord needs them, and he will let them go without delay." This happened that what, that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey, a beast of burden. Then the disciples went and Jesus, did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats upon them, and he set himself on them. And most of the crowd kept spreading their garments on the road and others kept cutting branches from the trees and scattering them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him kept shouting, Hosanna, O be propitious, graciously inclined to the son of David, the Messiah, blessed, praised, glorified is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, O be favorably disposed in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the city became agitated and trembling with excitement and said, who is this? And the crowds replied, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, like I said, there's a lot to unpack in that story. We, we, we read that Jesus sends his disciples to get him a donkey. He sits on the donkey and he makes his entrance into Jerusalem. Um, but understanding why this was symbolic and what this means right off the bat, And I might get a little ahead of my outline here, but right off the bat, um, something to know about the historical time that Jesus lived in was that whenever a king or a country, a nation would go to war with another nation, the king would go fight too. So the king was actually on the front lines of battle with his soldiers. Uh, so if a, if a city or a nation was fighting another city or a nation, uh, this, the king of that nation was actually absent while he was away fighting uh, with all the men in that nation as well. So most of the time, it was just women and children who were left behind. And whenever that king would uh, gain victory over their enemy and him and all of the soldiers and all the men that were away at battle would come back, they would all come back into the city together. And what would happen is that king who had been victorious, the people would line the streets. I don't know if you've ever watched like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade or you've ever seen a parade, a big celebration where there's a procession going down the road and there's people on either side of the road cheering, excited, watching what's taking place. Or if you've ever seen the movie Aladdin, uh, where uh, the prince would come into the city and he's got the elephants and he's got the dancers and all the people come out to see this great entrance into the city. You can kind of think of it like that. The people would come and they would line the streets and as an act of honor and humility, they would lay down their coats. They'd take their jackets off and lay them on the road. Uh, They would take palm branches and lay those out. And the king would enter and lead all of the soldiers back into the city. And so this kind of a procession or this kind of a... um, a great celebration of return would happen with a conquering warlord 
Okay, this only happened with kings, people who were royal, who lived in palaces and who would go off to battle to fight and win. And yet, interestingly enough, we see Jesus, who we know he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But at that time, the people, he wasn't, he wasn't royalty. He didn't live in a palace. He wasn't ruling a nation. He was just Jesus of Nazareth, uh, or so they thought. And yet we see Jesus, a seemingly insignificant, non-royal man who hasn't fought any battles, hasn't led any soldiers, hasn't gained any victory, so to speak, entering into the city of Jerusalem and the people's response was exactly the same as the response would be for a conquering warlord. I want you to think about that and, and we're gonna come back to that. I'm gonna explain the significance of that here in a second. But first of all, let's talk about the donkey because that's the very first thing it mentions uh, in verse two. Jesus commands his disciples to go and find a donkey for him tied up and to bring it to him. And, uh, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Bible about the Messiah. Um, and I, I can't even recall if we've talked about this on the broadcast before, but just to give you an idea, um, there were some scholars and some leaders who got together to actually analyze the Word of God and look at all of the different prophecies that the Old Testament has about the Messiah. I believe there's uh, several major prophecies and then there's, I think it's somewhere in the 700, 700 and something minor prophecies about the Messiah. And they calculated the chances or the odds that one man could fulfill all 700 and something prophecies in his lifetime. And they said that the odds of that actually being successful or that actually happening were the same odds as if I took um, silver dollars. If you've ever seen a silver dollar, uh, it's like a little bit bigger than a quarter. And uh, they said if they took silver dollars and they covered the entire state of Texas three feet deep in silver dollars, Okay, I want you to think about how big Texas is. Texas, at certain points of Texas, you can drive for 12 hours, hours and still be in Texas. So Texas is huge. Uh, and if you covered the entire state three feet deep in silver dollars, and I colored one single silver dollar red and just dropped it in, mixed it all up, and I took you and I put you in a helicopter and I, I pushed you out and you, you parachuted down and had to grab one silver dollar out of the pile. The odds of you grabbing that one red silver dollar are the same odds that one man could fulfill all those prophecies uh, at, 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 in, in his one lifetime. So I want you to realize how significant these biblical prophecies are and that Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. If that doesn't make you believe that Jesus is the son of God, if that doesn't make you believe that God exists, I don't know what will. <laughs> uh, Jesus fulfilled every prophecy. And there's a prophecy, prophecy in the book of Zechariah in chapter nine and verse nine. And it says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, for behold, your king comes to you. He is uncompromisingly just and having salvation, triumphant and victorious. He's patient, he's meek, lowly, and riding on a donkey, upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, Zechariah the prophet prophesied this over 500 years before this moment, before Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And here we see, a, just, this is just one prophecy that Jesus fulfilled, this king, this great king, entering into the city of Jerusalem, the capital of Israel uh, on a donkey, just like the prophet had prophesied over 500 years before that time. It's also interesting to note that in biblical times, it was actually common or normal for kings or important people to arrive uh, by a procession riding on a donkey. Uh, the donkey symbolized peace. And so those people who uh, chose to ride on a donkey rode them to signify or show that they came with peaceful intentions. So even in Jesus choosing to ride in and enter into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey, Jesus was professing himself as the Prince of Peace. And I wanna take a moment here, I just wanna pause. 
uh, on that, Jesus being the Prince of Peace. You know, He is peace itself. Peace isn't just a emotion that you feel. It's not just a physical state of mind, uh, but peace is a person, much like love is a person. Uh, peace is a person and it is Jesus. The word says that a mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And so for all who are anxious, for all who are sad, for all who are depressed, who all, for all who feel hopeless, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is there. Uh, he's given us His Spirit to minister that peace to us so that we can walk in peace despite our circumstances, despite how we might be feeling or what we might be going through. We can have the peace of God, the Prince of Peace, ruling and reigning in our hearts at all times. Amen. Okay, let's talk about the crowd. So Jesus was leading a crowd of his followers and disciples and many people who had possibly been following him since his earthly ministry began in Galilee almost three years prior to this moment. And these people had seen Jesus uh, perform many miracles and, and, and wonderful acts and, and all of these things. And a lot of them had seen these things firsthand. Uh, and, and this is really a moment where these people begin to see Jesus for who he really is. Jesus had spent his entire earthly ministry, his entire time with these crowds and even his own disciples prophesying about his death, prophesying about his resurrection, talking about preaching about the kingdom, preaching about repentance, talking about why he came and what he came to do and what he came to establish, uh, claiming that he was the son of God. And so many rejected him. So many also even if they didn't reject him, didn't understand these things that he was saying. And yet we see here, people begin to realize this, there's something different about this person. How would a common man, a preacher, a prophet, some, some said, a teacher, a rabbi, but not a king, warrant such a great response as he entered the city? The same response that a king would warrant. It's because people were realizing that this man is our Messiah, he's our savior. He's the one who's came to save us and to deliver us and to set us free. Now they thought um, that that freedom would, would look a certain way and that Jesus would actually take reign over Israel and, and, and uh, defeat their oppressors and that he would be a great uh, king of war. Uh, and we know now that, that of course, that's not the way that Jesus conquered. And that's not the way that Jesus uh, assumed his rightful place as king. But we do know he was a king and these people began to see that and they began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Hosanna in Hebrew actually means save us. So when these people are waving these palm branches and they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, they're crying out, save us, save us. They're be like I said, they're beginning to realize that this is a savior, that this is the Messiah, that, that Jesus is who he said he is, that he's the one who's come to save them. Uh, and they begin to hail him as king. And uh, it, it sounds a lot like Psalm 118, verse 26, if you've ever read the Psalm of David, where he says, blessed is he, who comes in the name of the Lord, which is exactly what Jesus was doing. And, um, and they wave palm branches as well. Now these palm branches are really interesting because um, palm leaves were actually symbolic in that time too. If you actually uh, look up Roman history, even if you look up old, uh, look at pictures of old Roman coins or Roman statues or works of art, um, you'll see that in that time, you'll see a lot of palm branches. Palm branches were on, were on uh, Roman money. Palm branches were on Roman works of art. They were engraved into the sides of their buildings, on their temples and, and their architecture. And it's because palm branches symbolized victory. And I, I, what I really wanna drive home in this message today, talking about Palm Sunday, talking about its significance, talking about this entrance of Jesus into the city, uh, why this matters to us is because this was in, in, by and large a prophetic action of Jesus. He's entering in, he hasn't won a war, but he's about to. He hasn't fought an enemy, but he's about to. He hasn't achieved victory yet, but he's about to. And the people without even knowing it, 
begin to prophesy this victory by waving these palm branches, by crying out Hosanna, by crying out, calling Jesus the son of David, acknowledging that he is the Messiah and that he is their savior. I wrote down here, the palm branch represented goodness and victory and was symbolic of the final victory he would soon fulfill over death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, it says, oh death, where is your victory? And we know that that's not just talking about a natural death when someone dies, but that's talking about spiritual death. What Jesus did at the cross and in the resurrection uh, was not only purchased uh, your life and your life more abundantly, a life of provision, a life of health, a life of prosperity, a, lot, a life of joy and of peace. But Jesus also uh, purchased eternal life and, and made this spiritual life a possibility. So even when your flesh dies, you don't. Even when this earth suit is buried six feet underground, you will be alive in the presence of God, dwelling in eternity with Him. Hallelujah. If that doesn't make you want to talk in tongues, I don't know what will, but we see that, that there is this eternal gift of life, this eternal victory over death purchased for us, and it's prophesied right here even before it all takes place, even just as Jesus enters in uh, to the city. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, in Luke's account, I know we read Matthew uh, chapter 21, we read Matthew's account today, but in Luke's account, it goes on to talk about how after Jesus entered into the city, he began to weep and lament over the city of Jerusalem. And even in the midst of this moment where all these people are praising him and he's being given all of this glory and this honor uh, and this worship, he knew that it wouldn't be long before these same people would turn their backs on him. It was the same crowd that shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. The same crowd that shouted, Jesus, save us. You're the Messiah is the same crowd who just a few days later would shout, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus being God, fully God and fully man, knowing that these people were lost, knowing that these people needing a, needed a savior, looking at these people with compassion in his heart, knowing that these same people who loved him and, and were, were celebrating him were also gonna turn their backs on them. He weeps, not because uh, his feelings were hurt, <laughs> but he weeps because he was so attuned to how, how much they needed him, how much these, how broken they were, how much they needed a savior, how much purpose there was in him coming, being born as a baby and, and living his life as a man and all of the things that Jesus witnessed and went through and walked through, uh, he's realizing that these people need a savior. And that is really the, um, the best thing to remember as we reflect on Palm Sunday is that Jesus came to save us. And even as he entered into that city uh, with people welcoming him, uh, he knew that there was a death, that there was coming persecution, that there was coming um, not just physical death, but also spiritual death. That he, the Bible says, that he who knew no sin became sin. He knew he was gonna be separated from the Father and, uh, and he knew that we needed victory, a victory that we couldn't achieve on our own, victory over oppression and over lack and over sickness and over disease, victory uh, in, in areas of our lives that we could never earn for ourselves. And Jesus, our conquering King, our Prince of Peace, came to win the battle for us. Amen. Aren't you glad he came? Aren't you glad he was obedient even unto death? I know I am. And as we approach Palm Sunday coming up here in just about a week, I want us to remember that. Remember why he came. Remember that he's your Prince of Peace. Remember that he's your good shepherd, that he's your faithful sa savior and uh, that he is always present. He's mighty to save, mighty to redeem you so that you can live in the peace and the victory that he won for you at Calvary. Amen. Amen. Well, we're excited to just dive right on in for the next few weeks on this series. So don't go away. Make sure you tune in next week. And remember until then that God loves you and we love you and Jesus is Lord. Hey, if you've watched today's broadcast and you want to give your life to the Lord and receive this gift of salvation, or if you just want to rededicate your life, 
Say this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, your word says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus, come into my heart. Take my life. Do something with it and use it for your glory. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Congratulations, if you pray that prayer, welcome to the family. We wanna know about it, we wanna hear from you. So if you've prayed this prayer and you've rededicated your life to the Lord, or if this is your first time praying the prayer of salvation, email us, email us at 1440 at emic.org. God bless you.